Today we conclude our series AD, Easter Changes Everything, because yesterday was actually the last day of the season of Easter, and today is Pentecost. Today is Pentecost, the birthday of the church, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and a day where we recognize that God always speaks in our language. So here are these words from the book of Acts, the second chapter. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed like tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts from Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. (laughs) This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Oh God, we thank you on this Pentecost Sunday for your Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit that came on that day and comes again and again wherever we are, that we might hear your word, that we might be able to receive something from you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So on May 11th, 2018, there was a freshman at Flowery Branch High School in Georgia named Katie Hetzel, and she was studying world literature, and they were making her do different spelling words with, and writing out the vocabulary, and she came across one word that for whatever reason she was unfamiliar with, and the word was spelled L-A-U-R-E-L. She wasn't sure how to pronounce the word, so she went online, and she clicked the link, and when she clicked the link, she heard this. Let's see if we can hear this. How many of you hear the word Yanny? There's a couple of you who do. Everyone else is like, yeah, we know. It's spelled Laurel. We get it, right? But back in 2018, when this first happened, it, became, it went viral pretty quickly overnight, where folks would begin to send this clip of the vocab- from vocabulary.com to hear where they would click on the word, and where most people would hear the word Laurel, everyone else who listened to it would hear the word that seems completely, remotely different from it, the word Yanny, which is not even a word. Again, how many of you heard Yanny? See, now more of you are recognizing. You're like, I wasn't crazy. I wasn't the only one. I thought it said Yanny. It's the strangest thing. It's the strangest thing. In fact, when they did surveys about it, it said about 47% of the folks heard the word Yanny, and another 54, uh, 53% heard the word Laurel. Apparently, when it comes to the word being recorded, which was originally Laurel, because of sound waves and the ways in which the sound was compressed and and processed over time based on the quality of the sound coming from your speakers and the age of your ears and those depending on whether or not they could hear at higher or lower frequencies better, it changed the word entirely. So even though it was in one language, It was like they were speaking two completely different languages. Sometimes what we talk about when we when we talk about a situation like this is is called selective hearing. Now, if you were to nudge the person next to you or someone that's close to you and you ask them, "Have you ever practiced selective hearing?" You already know what the answer would be, because we do it every day. We do it all the time. Selective hearing is this practice where we say, "Huh? What?" 
and we recognize that the message was intended to be for us. In fact, I'm realizing as we get to the end of the school year and summer is beginning that that is likely to be the answer to every question I ask my children. Huh? What? Selective hearing. I practiced it a lot as a young person. I practiced it a lot in school when the teacher's words would sound like Charlie Brown, wah, 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 right? Or when we're watching TV and there's some folks who all they can do when they're watching TV or movie is focus on that and they hear nothing else. Parents learn to do this with their children, especially when the child is crying all night long or Wives probably do this sometimes with their husbands, husbands with their wives. There was an Adam Sandler movie called Click where he had a remote control and he could speed up his life and slow it down, but the button that he prized the most was the mute button. Some of you call those hearing aids, right? (laughs) You do that, right? You don't want to hear what's going on around you. But when we have, when we practice selective hearing, over time, we, we get to this place where we don't elect to not hear each other. Instead, our brains become wired in such a way where they hear things differently. Our brain becomes so stimulated that it uses existing information that goes into the precise neurological pathways to focus its attention on the thing that benefits us the most. It's part of the way in which the brain um, is going to to the sort of the natural fight or flight pathway. We're going to go to what's easiest, most comfortable, most beneficial to us. And the older we get, the more deep those grooves begin to get so that when we hear something, that seems foreign to us, when we hear something that seems to be of a different opinion or understanding than us, we are far more likely, whether consciously or unconsciously, to tune it out and act as if it's a completely different language. And this impacts just about everything, as we do as a church, as as a culture, and as a family. Not only in our ability to listen to one another in conversations, but it also impacts our resistance to change, even when we know change would be good for us. It impacts our choices, our habits, our preferences. It impacts our desire to try new things or maybe even to imagine that God could be up to something new. Over time, it becomes where we really feel like we are speaking in different languages. Have you ever been to a crowded restaurant where you're First language was not the main language being spoken. So maybe you've gone to a really, really good Mexican food restaurant where the, the, the Mexican food is made by Mexican people and the Mexican people are eating the Mexican food and then you know that's the right spot to be in. And pretty quickly you recognize that you, you, you may know third grade Spanish, but pretty quickly you recognize that everybody around you is speaking a different language. And it's easy for us to tune that out and then begin to focus on the things like our food, right? The things that are closest to us. If you've ever traveled internationally and you've gone to an airport, it doesn't take you long to begin to ignore all the signs that are written in foreign characters and begin to focus our attention towards the things that, uh, that uh, that that are most applied to us. Sometimes we... It affects us in the way in which we can be just sort of on the wrong frequency. We can be out of tune with one another. It makes our conversations difficult. And it makes finding common ground seem to be impossible. And this is true on just about any touchy topic that we could possibly get into. Whether it's about raising or lowering the debt ceiling, whether it's about particular politicians, whether it's about uh, different issues that, that, the, that the church and the world cares about. Uh, we get so comfortable in our own language and our own opinions that it can be difficult to hear something new. And God hears us speaking and opining about all of these different things, and the word that we often use for this is just babble. The closest related passage in the Old Testament to what's happening on Pentecost is the story from Genesis chapter 11, which is the story of the Tower of Babel. I want to remind you of these words. Now, the whole world had one common language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, 
And when you hear the word eastward at the beginning of Genesis, this is always outside of God's intent, original plan. East of Eden is where they go to dwell when they're kicked out of Eden. And the farther east they go from Eden, the more we recognize the impact of sin and brokenness and how far they have fallen. They moved to a place east of Eden uh, in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. Let's use bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. We're going to build a tower, and we want to use the really good stuff that will last. And then they said to themselves, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves. Do you notice anything about this passage? There's very little mention about God, right? In fact, there's no mention about God at all. The people had one common language. They had one common language. They had the same tongue. They were using the same words. And together they they decided that they would build a tower as tall as possible to be equal, if not superior, to God. And the story tells us that God comes down and scatters the languages. Because to God it began to sound like Babel. See, when we think about Pentecost, they're gathering from all the places around the earth, and we think maybe our issues with one another, maybe our tendencies towards selective hearing or not understanding each other, whether it's at a restaurant or at a hospital or across the aisles of the church, has something to do with the language that we're speaking. But Babel teaches us that it's not a problem of language. Babel had, they had one language at Babel, and look where it got them. Left to their own devices, with one language, with their own plans, their own opinions, even with no language barrier, they still lacked God. So what we see on Pentecost is something that only God can do. And there's something particular about this Pentecost passage that for many, many years I read right past, because I've always assumed that what the what the Holy Spirit did at Pentecost was allow everybody to speak the same language. And I realized a number of years back when I began to preach this year after year that that's not the case at all. If God wanted everybody in the upper room to speak Swahili, they would have all spoke Swahili. If God wanted everybody in that room to speak Greek, they would have all spoke Greek. But instead, when the Holy Spirit comes, what's amazing to the people that are around is that each of them hear the gospel message presented in the language that they understand, in the language that they're comfortable with, in their dialect, with their words. Throughout the gospels, we see Jesus gathering a group of disciples, mostly those from Galilee, mostly uneducated fishermen, Mostly those who were without a high level of education, they all spoke the, the typical language of the street or the, of the community, the, the Koine Greek it was called, a very low form of Greek, and they spoke this language to each other. And, and, and what we see in Jesus is that his ministry was a very particular localized ministry. Jesus didn't come being pre-programmed to speak every single language in the, in the world. He spoke Aramaic, he knew Greek, and he called those disciples who he was familiar with in that place and time to follow him. When he's preparing his disciples for what's going to happen after, he, after his life, death, resurrection, and then ascension, he tells them that, he will be, that it's better for him to go away because if he goes away, the Holy Spirit will come and the Holy Spirit will be able to do even greater things than they've seen in him. Namely, one of them is the ability to speak the Father's language. Hear this in John chapter 16. Very truly I tell you, it's for your good that I'm going away. Because unless I go away, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. I have so much more to say to you. More now than you can bear. 
But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. It's a little complicated, a little convoluted there, but John has given us this beautiful picture of the Trinity, is that what God the Father speaks, God the Son speaks, God the Holy Spirit speaks. And in many ways, what we see on Pentecost is that the Holy Spirit could be known as God the Great Translator, right? The Holy Spirit is what makes the work of God, the acts of God, real for all of the people of God. All of this belongs that the Father gives to me is mine. That's why I said to you, what you receive from me, he will make known to you. And then as we've explored over our series the last weeks, over the next 40 days, Jesus continues to make himself physically known and present before the disciples, before his family, before those who uh, he wanted to interact with while he could still physically be on the earth in the resurrected state. But after the ascension, he tells them, wait here in Jerusalem, because something far better is coming. The Holy Spirit is coming, and when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll empower you to be my witnesses. And what do witnesses do? Witnesses speak about what they've seen. If you happen to be at a four-way intersection, and two cars bump into each other going 20 miles an hour, we're trying to keep keep it a nice image for the morning, And they both stop, and they're very kind and courteous, and they give each other their information, and you sit there and you watch it happening, and the police show up, you are a witness. Because what you're called to do is to tell honestly about what you've experienced. That's what Jesus tells them that the Holy Spirit will do. It will empower them to be his witnesses, but not just where they are. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, "They will be you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, In Judea and in Samaria, okay, if we're going to talk about languages, check, 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 Koine Greek, Aramaic, those are all spoken in the areas immediately surrounding it, and then to the ends of the earth. I wonder if it gave them pause. How in the world are we going to do that? We're just Galilean fishermen. Seven weeks after Jesus' resurrection, Jews from all over the known world had gathered together. These were Jews who had been, many of whom who had been exiled into Babylon, the land of Babel, where they had been forced to take on another culture, another language, others' customs, and had tried their best to remain true to the God that they knew and the faith of their fathers and mothers before them. They did so by making these annual pilgrimages three different times, the Festival of Tabernacles, the Festival of Passover, and then for the Festival of Pentecost, which was the time where they recognized when God spoke to Moses at Sinai and gave Moses the cloud, uh, gave Moses the law. But that law was given through a cloud. It was given in a way that only Moses could speak to God. It was a one-on-one relationship between Moses and God, and then Moses comes down, and then Moses is the intermediary between the Word of God and the people who had gathered. And so there, they celebrated this year after year for hundreds and hundreds of years. So you have Jews from all over the known world gathering together in that place to celebrate what God had done one time so, so long ago. And the disciples are gathered there as well. And it's in that place where they're gathered that, God, that Jesus' promise comes true. They're all sitting together and the wind begins to blow. And what looks like tongues of fire begin to alight on top of their heads. And then they begin to speak in tongues not of their own. Not angelic tongues, but tongues other languages of the very people who had gathered from all over the world to come to Jerusalem to hear about what God had done one time long, long ago. And the people hear 
about the good news of Jesus. They hear about his life, his death, his resurrection, the freedom that he grants, the joy that he promises, the forgiveness that he offers through faith in him. And they begin to gather around in that place and they are utterly amazed and astonished. Listen to what they say. Are all of these people who are speaking Galileans? You mean those, the dumb fishermen from that tiny little town up in Galilee? They don't have, you know, they don't have Rosetta Stone. They don't have uh, apps that can teach you different languages. All of a sudden, something that only God can do. They begin to hear God's word speaking to them in their own language. If you've ever traveled to a place where you don't know the native language of the, the lingua franca of the area that you're in, and you don't have a, tra- I've, I've traveled where a place where I didn't have a traveling partner or a companion, and I'm the only one who speaks English, and no one else does, and as soon as I hear English, what do my ears do? That's selective listening, right? I go to that place. I say, where am I? Where is the bathroom, right? And I'm able to hear and to know and to get the things that I need, and I am able to have directions and guidance of the places I need to go, and I'm introduced to the people I need to meet so that while I'm there visiting, I might not feel like a stranger, but feel like I belong, and I'm welcomed into that place. The people who have gathered there, they're from everywhere. In fact, this is often the passage that I like to give to brand new pastors coming out of seminary like Pastor Annie, but she's not here today. She's coming in a couple of weeks. Otherwise, I'd make her read this to make her read all these words, Parthians and Phrygias and Pamphylia and Pontus and Cappadocia, all of these countries, all of these places all over the world, these big, huge words of these incredible countries of that time. And now each of them hear about the great work of God in their own language. In their own language. You know, this is, this is a further manifestation of what it means for God to be with us. When, we're pro- when Mary has promised the son Jesus, he's called Emmanuel, God with us. And as he comes and he, he lives his life and he's his amazing miracles and teaching and his death and his glorious resurrection and on Ascension Day, it's sort of, it seems like it's God leaving us, right? God far from us. But Jesus tells us to wait on the Holy Spirit and when the Holy Spirit comes, we see once again that it is God with us, God in us, God through us. And now it's God with us, not just in one particular place in time, in one particular country, in one particular language, but now through what the power of the Holy Spirit does, it is now God with us to any who will listen, any around the world. It started in Jerusalem, in a particular place, in a particular language. But because of the Holy Spirit and the power of God at work in the lives of those disciples, it didn't stay there. It didn't stay there. Because the Holy Spirit allowed for it to be translated into all of the languages around the world. And they went back home and they told others in their own language. You know, it's different from in some religious traditions. The word of God in Islam is only the word of God if it's in Arabic. There were times in different churches in the Roman Catholic Church where it was only the true mass if it was said in Latin. What we talk about when we're talking about Pentecost is the continued incarnation, the indwelling of God and the Holy Spirit who now we understand speaks in our language, which divisions that come because of politics or because of, uh, of languages of origin or the places that we're born, we're able to speak to each other. And on Pentecost, we're reminded that we have been given a power an authority, and a command to go and to speak. Because there's someone in your life who wants to know, does God speak my language? They think about God and they think, oh, well, God is for, 
you know, God's for old religious fuddy-duddy people who think it's cool to wear red on Pentecost. <laughs> or or God, God is really for folks who, who look like me or who have the same kind of bank account I do. Or, or God is, you know, religion's interesting, but it's not for me. And, and part of that is the failure, that it, the church's failure to allow Pentecost to repeat itself again and again. By us being open to the movement of the Holy Spirit, we allow God to do a new thing in us and a new thing in this place that we might continually learn the language of the people around us, whether that's literally or culturally or the way in which they act and speak and talk of those who God has come to save. We may never again speak the same language. In fact, I would imagine that heaven looks a little bit like that, where we're all walking around speaking the language that we know the best, but we've got one of those, you know, those translator devices in our head. We don't have to go and sit up and say, everybody, guys, you're in heaven now. You have to learn the angel language. No. We just speak to each other, and we will know. We may never have the same language, but we all have the same word to speak. It's a word of peace and a nation that continues to show its signs of a love of violence, a word of hope in the midst of death, a word of joy when there is sadness, a word of clarity in the midst of the confusion that comes through social media and the news, and a word of love, a word of love when others are speaking hate. And these words from the Holy Spirit, when they are spoken to someone who is wondering, does God speak my language? Does God love me? Is God for me? Is God with me? Pentecost, the answer is yes. It's on that day where through the power of the Holy Spirit, they all began to speak in the languages of those who had surrounded and it's on that day that, they, that, that over 3,000 believed. They're amazed, they're astonished, and they wonder, what are we supposed to do with this information? And the Apostle Peter, now filled with the Holy Spirit, says, repent, believe in the good news, and be baptized. And over 3,000 were added to their number that day. May the same Holy Spirit indwell us now here in this place. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.